Hi, and welcome to this webinar on diagnosing and managing cow's milk protein allergy in primary care. My name is Dr. Helen Howells, and I'm a GP with a specialist interest in allergy. Thank you to Nestle for asking me to speak today. This webinar is going to be 45 minutes long, followed by 15 minutes of questions at the end. So if there are any questions that you can think of as we go through, then please do message them through to us and I'll answer as many as I can. I'm a GP in Dorset in the UK, so down near the beach, and I also work with the Southampton Paediatric Allergy Team. I've been doing this for the past four and a half years, although currently, sadly, I'm not um, working with them at the moment due to the COVID pandemic, as my skills are needed in primary care at the moment. Like so many, I became interested in allergy too much, um, due to my own personal experiences. Uh, my son Ethan, who's 11 now, had a milk and nut allergy when he was little, um, and so we spent quite a lot of time in the allergy clinics. I realised very quickly that I knew absolutely nothing about allergy and made lots of mistakes in his management, which I often share with my families and find that's really quite useful, um, as I think it helps them feel that they can relate to me. Um, and also often to reassure them that they're not bad parents um, because anything that they say I've probably done worse. Um, when I used to attend his appointments, his allergy consultant encouraged me to undertake the masters in Southampton um, in allergy and I did that when I was quite heavily pregnant with my third child and I now lecture on the masters and I spend quite a lot of time teaching across the country in allergy. I chair the primary care group of the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and sometimes I see these three terrors here, um, although I'm told not often enough. I'm sponsored by lots of different companies to um, give lectures. And I think it's really important to provide education where we can. And I'm really passionate about that as I want um, patients and uh, children and families to have good allergy care. Um, so it's really important for us um, to have. Unfortunately, in the UK, allergy is often not taught very well. It isn't included on many undergraduate or postgraduate curriculums, um, which we've been battling to change. Um, and so it is important to be sponsored to be able to provide education to change the pathways of patients. In this lecture, what we're going to have a look at is the prevalence of cow's milk protein allergy and the challenges associated with its diagnosis, particularly about non-IGE mediated cow's milk protein allergy. We're going to have a look at the differences of IGE and non-IGE mediated protein allergy and think about how to manage each of those and what advice we should be giving to families and patients. We're going to use a nice guideline, so some case histories, and there'll be some questions which you can think about the answers at home, and I will um, enlighten you as we go, hopefully. Calcium protein allergy is incredibly common, affecting about 2 to 3% of children. And because obviously it's an allergen that we give early in life, it, it presents early in life. It rarely presents after 12 months of age because most infants have already been exposed to it before that. So usually it's something that comes in the first three to six months of life or so, depending on when it's given. IgE mediated allergy is usually relatively obvious and so often picked up quite quickly. But the problem comes, as I've said, with non-IgE mediated health or protein allergy. And there can be multiple presentations, and this has been shown in lots of studies, that often families have to take their infants multiple times to their GP, or health visitors, or the out bowel service, or the emergency departments before the diagnosis is made. And this can be incredibly challenging for those families. And although calcium protein allergy is a very hot topic at the moment, and certainly uh, used to be in the media quite a lot, um, not so much so now due to COVID, but certainly before that, the prevalence is thought to actually be um, relatively unchanged. Um, it's something that hopefully people are becoming more aware of, certainly um, families often are, um, but it's thought that overall the prevalence hasn't really changed, and it's something that is actually quite rare in adults. Worldwide, you can see that cow's milk protein allergy is very common, um, appearing in the top five uh, list of allergens in, in most countries across the world. And as you can see, it's much more common in formula fed infants, so 2 to 4% of formula fed infants will have a cow's milk protein allergy as opposed to only 0.5% of those who are breastfed. I think it's in incredibly important to um, encourage breastfeeding where possible. Um, and personally, I breastfed all three of my own children until they were 18 months of age. I think that's really important um, to encourage, um, particularly 
and you can use this evidence to explain that actually it's much less likely that they'll develop codes with palatal protein allergy if they're breastfed. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it does still occur, and then we need to know what advice to give to our families. So as we've said, cow's milk protein allergy presents early in life, and it's important to get the diagnosis right early on. And there are many different reasons for that. Obviously, one of the reasons is that if the diagnosis is delayed, then families undergo quite a traumatic time. I mean, individuals with non-IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy do tend to cry and cry and cry and be really very unsettled, very challenging babies. Um, and often I find that the mums do actually suffer with postnatal depression as a consequence, or certainly the dynamics in the family can be quite difficult and there can be quite a lot of upset. Um, so it's important for families to get the diagnosis right. Obviously, there can be issues with feeding difficulties if the diagnosis is missed. And sometimes on the more severe end, then there may be issues with um, the weight gain of that child if the diagnosis is missed. And the other thing that we see with non ige mediated cow's milk protein allergy is that infants and children who don't get this diagnosis made at all, um, or where it's made late, seem to go on and develop functional gastrointestinal disorders. So we quite commonly see children in our clinics who suffer with chronic abdominal pain or constipation. And when you track back through the history, sometimes you can find that, in fact, they had a non-IGE mediated cow's milk protein allergy that wasn't picked up, um, or that was diagnosed very late on in life. And there is some evidence developing around that. And it's thought that actually if you diagnose it early, then maybe these things won't come on and develop. The trouble is that non-IGE mediated cow's milk protein allergy is challenging to diagnose because many of the symptoms replicate those of other conditions. So it really has to be something that's on a physician's agenda in all, and radar, really, in order to be able to pick it up. As I've said, it's really important for families that we pick it up. And what we know is that, as with any, anything in medicine, really, that patients and families and parents, they just want to feel that you are listening to them. And what we know with the non ige mediated cow's milk protein allergy is if you diagnose it early, then families will often be much more on board with listening to what you're saying and following the correct management plan and re-challenging their infants to get the diagnosis right with cancer protein allergy. And if you don't do that, then they will look for what's going on with their baby in other areas. And there's so much available on the internet at the moment, as we know, which sometimes is really useful, um, but can actually be quite harmful. So they will turn to social media, to the internet to look at what's wrong with my baby. They will listen to other people's advice. And then you may find that these um, poor infants will have uh, quite significant dietary restrictions because families will be trying to figure out what's wrong on their own without appropriate input. And then, as I've said, these children can have quite restricted diets as a consequence. One of the uh, um, issues is that this group of conditions really called functional gastrointestinal disorders. So there are a group of chronic uh, conditions that are incredibly common and cause recurrent symptoms and a lot of upset in the family. And it's where there's a functional problem, but without any structural or biochemical abnormality. So essentially, it's a normal part of the development process of infants. Um, it's something that comes to a group of conditions that can be managed completely in primary care. With often just with reassurance, some practical strategies, or occasionally some dietary modifications. Um, they're diagnosed based on the symptoms that present, and when we look at the Rome diagnostic criteria which have been developed. We may recognise them, but these are some of the um, uh, conditions that are listed with these functional gastrointestinal disorders, so regurgitation, diarrhoea, constipation, colic or infant dyspnea, which is where infants strain and strain and seem to go red in the face for about 10 minutes or so before they pass a soft stool, which is just a normal process really of infants learning to increase their intra-abdominal pressure and relax their pelvic floor at the same time. But families quite often mistake that as infants struggling um, with opening their bowels. What we know is particularly in first um, parents with first time children, that these um, conditions can cause them quite a lot of upset. So they'll often present to their GPs uh, many, many times about their child's regurgitation or colic, for instance. 
And some of these signs and symptoms will cross over with non-IgE mediated calcium protein allergy. And that's where the challenge of diagnosis comes in. As I said, it's incredibly common for infants to have these gastrointestinal disorders. As you can see, over half of infants will have them in the first month to six months of life, um, as opposed to only two to five percent of infants will have calcium protein allergy. So it's really important to have some strategies in your mind. So how are you going to differentiate out whether this is just a normal functional gastrointestinal disorder that needs reassurance or whether this is calcium protein allergy that needs some proper treatment? And I'll help you figure that out. The other thing that commonly gets misdiagnosed is lactose intolerance. So individuals with a non-IGE mediated calcium protein allergy are quite often told that they have a lactose intolerance incorrectly. So lactose, as we know, is a carbohydrate that's present in milk and dairy products. And we need our lactase enzyme, which is present on the intestine or brush border, in order to break down lactose. And if we don't have that, what will happen is water will be absorbed into the gut and there'll be fermentation of the bacteria. And then you will end up with these signs and symptoms. And it's very quickly, within 30 minutes to two hours, you get tummy pain, swelling, bloating, flatulence, and explosive diarrhea. It is really important that calcium protein allergy isn't confused with lactose intolerance. So there are different forms of lactose intolerance. There is congenital lactose intolerance, which essentially, of course, would mean that the individual was born with it. And in the UK and most areas of Europe, that is incredibly rare. So there are some Finnish populations where it's common and some um, populations in Japan where it's common. But it's so uncommon in the UK that we don't even test for it. So if you're sending a baby to us in secondary care saying that they have a lactose intolerance, um, then it's highly unlikely that you're correct and it's more likely that this is a non-IGE mediated calcium protein allergy. It is relatively common for um, infants and children to get a secondary lactose intolerance where they get damage to their brush border um, frequently from a gastrointestinal infection, so from gastrointestinal gastroenteritis, sorry. Um, so their, their brush border will be damaged. And for a period of six to eight weeks, they will only be able to tolerate lactose-free product, um, products until that lactose, lactose enzyme regenerates for them. Um, that isn't the same as a cow's milk protein allergy because individuals with a cow's milk protein allergy would, would still have symptoms with lactose-free products because they still contain cow's milk. It's important to make sure that we are diagnosing infants correctly. So if you have a young infant, um, it is more than likely that you are thinking of a non-IGE mediated calcium protein allergy rather than a lactose intolerance. So let's start with some cases. So this is our first case of Ben. So Ben's six months old and brought by his parents who were worried that he has an allergy. He was given porridge, which contained milk, for the first time yesterday. And within 10 minutes, he developed urticaria, which is hives across his face, and mild swelling around his eyes. He didn't get any treatment and his symptoms resolved within an hour, and he was otherwise completely well that day. He was exclusively breastfed, but he did have one bottle of formula at bath, which is quite common. And so far, he's had fruits and vegetables with no problems, and he has no other past medical history of note. So thinking to yourself, what's the most likely cause of Ben's symptoms? Do you think he has an IgE-mediated health or protein allergy, a non-IgE-mediated health or protein allergy, or maybe a viral illness? you will realise that the most likely cause of Ben's symptoms is the IgE mediated calcium protein allergy, and we'll come on to why. So NICE have very clearly defined the signs and symptoms that are associated with IgE and non-IgE mediated calcium protein allergy, and broken it down into the different systems involved. So we're going to have a look through those to help us work this out. So when we're looking at IgE mediated allergy, they may get pruritus, so itching, erythema, redness, urticaria, which of course is hives, and acute angioedema, which is swelling. So if you're talking about any of those signs and symptoms, so if an individual presents to you with hives or swelling, you're thinking potentially about IgE-mediated allergy, as opposed to non-IgE-mediated allergy, where they get itching, so pruritus, erythema, or atopic eczema. Um, what I would just mention with the non-IgE allergy is just thinking that usually with the non-IgE allergy, we are looking at infants presenting often in the first few months of life. So this is infants with early onset eczema. 
So if we're talking about a much older child, say three, four, five with eczema, it's less likely that food allergy is causing the eczema. When we're talking about non-IGE mediated allergy, really we're talking about infants. Moving on to the gastrointestinal system. So when we're looking at the IgE mediated symptoms, they may get androedema, so swelling of their lips, tongue, and palate, and itching within their mouth. And this is really very common. And little ones quite often describe it as a spiciness or a spikiness. And this is one where I give one of those examples of my own son Ethan. So when he had his milk allergy, um, food labeling laws were not quite so clear. So it wasn't always obvious whether milk was contained within his food or not. So sometimes he would refuse to eat his food. Like a good mum that I am, I would say, no, no, eat your food, eat your food. And he would refuse. But eventually with some encouragement, he would eat his food and then he would very quickly develop hives and swelling. And as he got older, he'd be able to tell me that the food tasted funny or it made his mouth itch. And that's, it was often that aversion that he knew about. And sometimes individuals will and be aware that their food contains the allergen they're allergic to before they even taste it. I do encourage families to try and take note of what their little ones are doing and, and listen to them. Um, but certainly, pruritus is associated with IgE immediate strategy. They may also get immediate onset of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and tummy pain. Now, when you look at the non IgE immediate allergy, you can see that this is a really gut heavy um, uh, condition, really. And you can look through that list and go, hmm, okay, but well, how many normal babies do I see that have colic? a bit of constipation or loose stool, and how can I work out whether they have a non-IGE mediated allergy or whether they're just a normal baby or have one of these functional gastrointestinal disorders. And what you need to do really is it's all about pattern recognition. So if you had an infant with just one of those symptoms, then it's highly unlikely this is going to be non-IGE mediated allergy. These individuals tend to have upper gut symptoms, so of reflux and vomiting, and lower gut symptoms, so maybe lots of loose frequent stools. So they often have several symptoms rather than just one. So if we look through the list, they may get gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, of course, as I said, they're often very unsettled um, babies that cry and cry and cry. They have loose frequent stools that mums often describe as a tsunami, where they have their leak absolutely everywhere. Or on the opposite end, they can have constipation. But more often than not, it's soft stool constipation. So they strain and strain, and when they do go, it's soft. If they're breastfed, they may have blood in the stool because they get a proctitis. But for reasons that we don't really understand, that doesn't seem to happen with formula fed babies. They may get tummy pain and colic. And some individuals will start to have food aversion or refuse the food. And of course, if that happens, then there may be issues with weight. They may get perioral redness. And if they're on the more severe end of a non IgE immediate strategy, then they're made to be faulty in growth. But what we find is that families are quite often faulty reassured, saying, oh, well, your baby's growing really well, that's not a problem. And actually, as I said, it's only if it's more severe disease that the, um, the height and the weight will be affected. And the other thing is that in the UK, quite commonly, the height is only checked for uh, maybe the six to eight week check, um, and their weight is checked much more frequently. And actually what we know in allergy, in all forms of allergy, is often it's the height that's impaired first, followed by the weight. And that children with allergies, even when the allergy is corrected, never seem to achieve their full height potential. So it's really important to check both, but to also not falsely reassure families that there's no problems if they have multiple other symptoms just because their child's growing well. Finally, when you look at the respiratory symptom, uh, respiratory system, sorry, for IgE mediated allergy, they may get essentially what looks like hay fever when they're exposed to the food they're allergic to. So they might start sneezing, have an itchy nose, rhinorrhea, rear, so a runny nose and congestion. Or they may get signs of um, anaphylaxis essentially, so lower respiratory involvement, so they may start coughing or wheezing, or breath or feel their chest is tight. And according to NICE, there are no respiratory symptoms associated with non IgE mediated allergy. But the map of the IMAP guidelines, which are the IMAP is the International Milk Allergy for Primary Care Guidelines, recognise that these infants are often quite congested. Now, as we probably all know if we work in primary care, um, it's quite common, particularly for first-time mums, to bring their babies to us quite often because they seem quite snotty all the time. Now, if that baby is snotty but has no other symptoms, so no early onset eczema, no gut involvement, 
then please don't diagnose that child with a non ITV mediated healthy personality. As I've said, they tend to have multiple involvement. So what we say is they often have multi-system involvement. So they have upper gut symptoms, lower gut symptoms, and then sometimes they be congested and get the skin involvement as well. So really what I just want you to have on your radar really is that when you have that fine infant consult, which is often the reason that they come to you, start running through in your mind the different questions. So do they vomit? Do they have signs of reflux? What are their bowels like? What's their height and weight like? What's their skin like? And are they congested? And when you start to run it through in your mind, I can guarantee you that you'll be much less likely to miss non IGE mediated pelvic personality. My key message for food allergy is think about what symptoms are involved. We've just run through the symptoms, and those are the only ones involved. So for IGE mediated allergy, it will be high, swelling, immediate onset of vomiting and diarrhea, upper respiratory symptoms, or lower respiratory symptoms involving anaphylaxis. For non IgE, it's early onset eczema, congestion, upper gut symptoms, and lower gut symptoms. Now, with IgE mediated allergy, timing is crucial. So, the allergic reaction will occur often very quickly, within seconds to minutes of being exposed to the food, but certainly within two hours. And it goes away within two hours. So, if someone's telling me their symptoms came on eight hours later, it's highly unlikely that's an IgE mediated allergy. It comes quickly. And it goes quickly. Whereas the timing with non IGE is quite hard to work out, really, because often, as you know, infants are being fed milk all the time, so it's hard to work out what's the relationship to the timing. But it tends to be two to 72 hours later. And sometimes that timing is more obvious when you take the food away and when you give it back. Then your parents will often say to you, oh, it's always the next day when their symptoms develop, or it's always eight hours later. And food allergy is always reproducible. So you don't get away with eating the food one day without problems, and then the problems occur the next, and then the next day they're okay. It happens every time you eat the food. So always think, what's the timing associated with this? What are the symptoms? And does this happen every time you eat the food? And then you'll hopefully get your diagnosis correct. So for IgE mediated allergy, like Ben had, then we might want to go on and do some investigations. So in the community, in the UK certainly, you can do blood tests, so we can check a specific IgE, and that's something you can order on ice. But we would recommend thoroughly that this is only done in conjunction with the history. So please don't do panels of random um, uh, food allergies to check what might you be allergic to and just randomly request them all, because these tests aren't perfect, and you can get false positives and false negatives. Really, it should be done only in conjunction with the history. So really all you're doing is confirming what you already know. So with Ben, you had a really good suspicion that it was likely he was allergic to milk because he was given it for the first time. It quickly developed hives and swellings and it went away very quickly. So you can do an IgE to milk. It will come back as a number um, and it will come back as a grade of one to four. And really all you're interested in is the number. So if it's over 0 0.35, then it's positive. So for Ben, if it came back at say one, then it's positive. Um, and that's what you need to know. The higher the number doesn't correlate with the severity of the reaction. So he could have an IgE of over 100, but never have anything more severe than height and swelling. It's completely unpredictable, unfortunately, for his allergy. But the higher the number doesn't dictate the likelihood that you have anaphylaxis. My own son, Ethan, his numbers were always relatively, relatively low. I think they were always about sort of five or six, so really not very high at all. And yet, unfortunately, he experienced anaphylaxis to milk several times. As I've said, just because you've got a positive test, it doesn't mean that you're truly allergic. And you do have to be very careful because if you cut foods out of individuals' diets without good reason, then there is the potential risk that they'll lose their tolerance to that food and develop an allergy. So you do have to be very careful. And total IG doesn't really have any relevance to food allergy. So please just choose what are you actually testing for and request that. If they come to us in secondary care or in some specialised um, community clinics, then we will do skin prick testing. So these are great because um, and families love them because you get an answer on your day. So they take about um, 15 minutes to perform and 15 minutes to get the result. You need to sort on any antihistamines for at least four days before, otherwise that will affect the result of the skin prick test. You don't need to um, stop antihistamines before a blood test, it won't affect the IgE in the blood. 
what you do is you basically write little letters along their arm so you know what you're testing and we have different solutions um, that we can test against in these new files here. You pop a little drop um, next to the letter and then you just prick the top layer of the skin with a lancet. So you're just introducing that allergen into the top layer of skin. And then you're looking to see after 15 minutes, so they develop a full hive, as you can see in the bottom picture. So it's not the redness, you just want to see what's the size of the wheel. And again, the bigger the wheel doesn't dictate the likelihood that they'll have a severe reaction. It's just helping you and working out whether or not they're truly allergic. And the nice thing about skin for tests is if we don't have the solution available, so say something that's not uh, hugely common, like I don't know, um, lentils, for instance, then we can prick some lentils and prick their skin and see if they react to that. But mostly this is only going to be something available in specialist clinic. So for burn in all likelihood, certainly in the UK, when you are worried about an IgE-mediated allergy, particularly milk, it's likely that we'll refer them to secondary care for management. And what they will do is do what we've hopefully done in primary care, take that allergy focus history to get in their mind whether or not they feel that Ben is truly allergic to milk. Once they've done this, they'll probably do skin prick tests. And that nice thing that we can do extra in um, secondary care is we can prick something that contains baked milk. So we make muffins in, in our hospital that contain baked milks and we can prick the skin and see whether or not he may be able to tolerate baked milk first as a way of inducing tolerance. And we review this yearly, um, at least until he's of school age, because often with milk allergy, they outgrow it very quickly. So as you can see, 87% of them will resolve by the age of three. So we review them yearly to see if things are changing. Um, and after that, if they get to school age, then we tend to see them every two or three years, as it's less likely that things have changed. Um, if it looks like the time is right that we can introduce baked milk into the diet, then it will be different from area to area. In our hospital, we bring them in, in for a food challenge to see whether they'll be able to pick from baked milk in their diet, or we let them go away and do that at home. At other hospitals, um, they will arrange home food challenges where they will be given baked milk at home first. This is the British Society of Allergy Specialist Milk Ladder for IgE mediated healthy protein allergy. And you can see the different stages involved. So on stage one, they'd just be given the tiniest crumb of a biscuit that contained cow's milk protein allergy. And they will slowly build that up over time. But what I would say for us in primary care, certainly in the UK, is this is not a ladder that we're going to be instigating in primary care. This is going to come from specialist guidelines, um, specialist guidance as to when it should be instigated. But it's just so you're aware of it. And the other thing that I would say is in uh, other countries, so in Europe, their gold standard of diagnosis for IgE mediated um, cow's milk protein allergy um, would be with a food challenge. So um, giving that child cow's milk protein allergy, uh, cow's milk protein, sorry, in a controlled manner um, to see whether or not they're symptomatic. And actually, that's the gold standard for any of us, but often in the UK, it's not a step that we take. We usually would take the history and do either a blood test or a skin prick test. And if they both fit, then we would diagnose them with an allergy and then only reintroduce milk when we think they've outgrown it when we're talking about IgE mediated. So going on to Seth now. So Seth is a three-month-old baby and he's born in a bed. He has no eczema and he has small posits after feeds at normal schools. He's frequently unsettled and cries in the evening, and this lasts for a few hours, and then it resolves. What do we think is wrong with Seth? Do we think he has a non ige immediate cow's milk protein allergy, colic, or reflux? And hopefully with Seth, you'll realise that the likeliest cause of his symptoms is colic. And the reason for that he has no other signs and symptoms suggested with a non ige immediate allergy. So he has normal posits, so he has no upper gut symptoms. He has no lower gut symptoms. He's got normal bowels. He's got no skin involvement. We don't know if he's congested, but there's certainly nothing really pointing us in a non ige allergy. And he's only really unsettled in the evening, so it's not even really suggested of reflux when these individuals tend to cry for a bit longer. So this would all need just, just reassurance that this is just a normal problem. Um, and will improve as Seth gets older. And there are some useful websites out there like the Crisis website, so um, CRY-SIS, it's a UK charity base, which will help um, families cope with the crying because it still can be quite distressing for them. Moving on to case history three of Sarah. So Sarah's three months old and was born at term, but needed IV antibiotics due to aspiration of meconium, and she's breastfed. 
and within two months of life she developed widespread eczema and her parents report she's constantly unsettled and crying. And you can see that she's had multiple attempts to see the emergency department and to her GP. She frequently vomits after feeds and has frequent explosive nappies. So what do we think is wrong with Sarah? Has she got a non-IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy, colic or reflux? Hopefully you'll see with Sarah that it's much more likely that she has a non-IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy. It's not definite at this stage, but it certainly should be flagging up as a possibility. There are a few things here, really. So she needed IV antibiotics when she was born, which is something that increases her risk of allergy developing, as does a cesarean. Obviously, she couldn't help that. This is something to be aware of. But she is breastfed, so we know that that's incredibly protective, with her only having a 0.5% risk of allergy forming. But when we look at her symptoms, we can see that she has multi-system involvement. So she has early onset of eczema within a couple of months of life. She has upper gut symptoms of vomiting and lower gut symptoms of frequent explosive nappies and also a really miserable unsettled baby. And definitely for me, flagging up that non-IGE mediated cow's milk protein allergy is a real possibility. There we go, that's a reminder that they have eczema, gut symptoms, the upper respiratory tract symptoms of congestion, possibly failure to thrive if they're on the more severe end of the spectrum, and the signs and symptoms develop after two to 72 hours of exposure. So now mum says, well, I really, really want to breastfeed. And what would you say? Would you say, well, you can't and you need to start a formula, a hypoallergenic formula. Or yes, you can breastfeed, absolutely, but you need to exclude all your milk from your diet. Or you can continue to breastfeed, but you need to exclude soya. Or you can continue to breastfeed, but you need to exclude milk and soya from your diet. And hopefully you'll know that the correct answer really is number two. So absolutely, we always want to encourage mums to breastfeed. And I can think of very, very few reasons that I've ever told anyone to stop. Um, so absolutely, it's a great thing. And there is some evidence that if mums will continue to breastfeed alongside weaning, then it will prevent um, other allergies from forming. So it's a great thing to do. Because Sarah is still quite early, then it's great because it seems that we pick this aller allergy up quite quickly. And therefore, you only need to exclude milk from mum's diet. There is a 50% crossover. So 50% um, of babies with a non-IGE mediated cow's milk protein allergy will also be allergic to soya. So occasionally, if I get babies that are picked up quite late and I want to get them better quickly, then I personally might exclude milk and soya from their diet in an effort to get them better quickly and get mums on board. And then what I'll do is really challenge them to one thing at a time to get mums to then put soya back into their diet and see whether symptoms come back and then put milk back into the diet and see if symptoms come back. But according to the guidelines, usually it's just milk that you need to exclude. You just need to be aware of that potential cross risk with soya. And there we go, as we say. And that it's important to be aware of that because often what will happen is if you tell mums to cut milk out of their diet, then what they'll go and do is have a soya latte, for instance, uh, and then wonder why their babies are still quite unsettled. So it doesn't happen before, but it happens for about 50%. As opposed to babies with an IgE mediated allergy, where only around 10 to 14% of those would have an IgE mediated reaction to soya as well. So for babies with an IgE mediated calcium protein allergy, it's on my radar that they might have a reaction to soya, but I don't usually warn parents too much about it or just get them to introduce other allergens and just be aware of any particular problems. But for mum, if she's avoiding soya, then it doesn't need to be completely strict. So um, in case you didn't know, bread contains soya flour and sausages often contain soya. So they don't need to exclude everything, but they just need to avoid using soya milk as their milk substitute. And certainly in the UK, then we need to prescribe calcium and vitamin D for breastfeeding mums to protect their bones, obviously. Um, and, but that will differ from um, country to country. So mum now says, so say Sarah is now five months old and mum says she wants to stop breastfeeding and return to work. So what formula would you recommend? You say, mum, you can go and buy any formula you want. Just pop to the shops and off you go and buy it. Or mum, you can go and buy yourself a soya formula. Or would you recommend an extensively hydrolyzed formula or an amino acid formula? Hopefully for Sarah, you'll realise that what we want to do is prescribe her an extensively hydrolyzed formula. And we'll talk about why. So here we go. So here's a bit of a breakdown about different, um, different milk chains. 
So here's an intact calcium protein um, chain on the end. And when it's broken down into smaller groups of peptides, so smaller shorter chains, these are the partially hydrolyzed formula, um, so-called hypoallergenic formulas that families can go and buy themselves. It's not something that we would be recommending for allergy per se, um, and certainly not something that we would be prescribing. So that's just something to be aware of that's on the market. When those chains are even more broken down, then these are extensively hydrolyzed formulas. And all extensively hydrolyzed formulas are slightly different. And part of the reason for that is that the protein chain is broken down in different areas, different parts, um, according to the formula. So that's part of the reason why um, they're different. When they are just individual amino acids, then of course that's an amino acid formula. And as we have said all the way through, really, that if mums can breastfeed and want to breastfeed, then of course we should be supporting them and encouraging that, them with, with that where possible. You then have extensively hydrolyzed formulas, amino acid formulas, and soya formulas, which you can buy over the counter, so we don't need to be, to be prescribing those either. And there are different reasons why we may choose one extensively hydrolyzed formula over another. Some of them are, are hydrolyzed whey protein, and some of them are, are casein-based formulas. And that uh, may have an implication for the infant as to whether or not they taste sweeter. Some of the um, whey protein um, formulas will contain lactose, which is said to be sweeter and more palatable for a baby, particularly if they're a breastfed baby, because breast milk is quite sweet. Um, but it isn't uncommon for infants, particularly over three months of age, to struggle to go onto these formulas. And we'll talk about ways in which you can help them with that. Soya formula is not recommended under the age of six months. And that's because of concerns that they contain phytoestrogens um, and concerns that you may feminize boys, for instance. There isn't great evidence about that, but certainly it isn't something that we um, are recommended to give below six months of age. But if they were over six months of age, then of course you could recommend it. You just need to be aware of that potential crossover. But also some uh, extensively hydrolyzed formulas aren't suitable for a halal or a vegetarian diet, so that's just worth knowing. And finally, there are some which will contain pre and probiotics. Um, and so some individuals will choose it based on that. Um, and I'll let you look up more about that if you wish. There are very specific reasons why you would prescribe an amino acid formula. Um, and these are them. So if you have an individual with faltering growth, very severe eczema, so perhaps eczema that really isn't controlled even with moderate strength steroids. Anyone who's had anaphylaxis, so with an Ig immediate calcium protein allergy. If infants um, have been given an extensively hydrolyzed formula and they seem to get a bit better, but not fully better, then quite often we will either trial another extensively hydrolyzed formulas if mums are on board with doing that, um, or it may be a reason why you might switch onto an amino acid formula. Anyone with severe gastrointestinal symptoms, so food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome or eosinophilic esophagitis. Again, unfortunately, I haven't got time to go into those, but those are severe gastrointestinal disorders. They would need an amino acid formula. And anyone who's multiply allergic. And it's said that only around 10% of infants will need an amino acid formula, but certainly in the UK, unfortunately, it's widely overprescribed. So it seems that more like 30% of individuals get an amino acid formula. And it matters for a few reasons, but one of the reasons is cost. So um, it's about uh, £12 a tin for uh, extensively hydrolyzed formula in the UK, as opposed to around £23 to seven, £27 a tin for an amino acid formula. So quite a big difference. So we do need to think about the cost involved, certainly uh, for the NHS, and to get that right. And also because it's felt that you're more likely to induce tolerance, potentially, if infants are given extensively hydrolyzed formulas, um, and therefore, if we can give them, then we should. Hmm. So when we first prescribed them, we only needed to give two tins initially to check that uh, the baby's getting on okay with it. And then we can switch them to um, monthly prescriptions. And there will be different guidelines in your regions um, or in your countries as to how much to give. But it's based on their age, but they'll need anywhere between 7 to 12, 400 gram tins, depending on their age. Unfortunately, the smell and the taste of all of these formulas is, is not as nice as uh, calcium protein formulas or breast milk, certainly. So there can be issues. Um, so different, there are different ways in which you can try and help them go on to these formulas. So as long as there's no anaphylaxis, so no real reason why you can't switch over slowly, then what you could do is say if a bottle's made up with six scoops of formulas, 
and six scoops of the milk. On day one, you can put in one scoop of the new formula with five scoops of the cow's milk protein. Cow's milk protein, sorry, formula. <laughs> and then on day two, you can put two scoops of the new formula with four scoops of the um, old formula and slowly titrate them across. And often babies will tolerate that. I do also have some families tell me that they'll sweeten it with vanilla essence and often they'll take it that way. Um, the other thing that families need to be told is that the stool can go all manner of colours, um, particularly green, and that doesn't, that's not a sign that they're not tolerating it, so you can reassure them. As long as there's no blood in them, then you can reassure them that it's completely normal um, and not to worry. Crucial thing, so as we've seen with IgE mediated allergy, a, it's often quite obvious, and, and we can then confirm the diagnosis with a skin boot test or a blood test, of course, in Europe with a food challenge. Non IgE mediated calcium protein allergy, unfortunately, there's no diagnostic test that exists as yet. So, the way that we need to test and diagnose it is by excluding the milk for two to four weeks and then putting it back in to confirm that their symptoms come back. And if you haven't done that, then you haven't made the diagnosis correctly. So if the mum is a breastfeeding mum and mum has taken milk out of her diet and after two to four weeks you talk to her and baby symptoms have all gone away, then what you would ask mum to do is to go back to her normal diet. So what some of my patients will do is the mum will just have a lot of latte and just monitor for a day or two to see if baby's tolerated that okay and then she'll put more milk back into her diet. And you will sometimes find that mum's put all the milk back into the diet and the symptoms don't come back. And that's because it was not a non ige mediated calcium protein allergy in the first place. It was either a functional gastrointestinal disorder or something else completely. If they're bottle fed, I really always tell families at the start that this is what we're going to do so that you've got them on board with it. Nobody wants to go back to a crying, miserable, screaming child, and I completely understand that. But you also do not want a child with allergy um, or to be experiencing exclusion of the food unless they really need to. And part of the reason for that is that you may cause problems. So if children have foods excluded from their diet, they may not um, form tolerance to it and it might cause problems. So often when you explain that to families, they're much more on board with it. And I also reassure them that, look, you know, it might only be that your child has one bottle of the um, old formula. And if all the symptoms come back, that's enough. That's diagnosis made. I'm not going to make you continue this on for another month to confirm it. It's just to see, do the symptoms come back? So the way that I do it is the reverse of what I just said. So if the bottle formula is made up with six scoops, I'll take one of the prescription formula out and put one of the calcium protein formula back in and see over the day that the signs and symptoms reoccur. And if they don't, then the next day, put two scoops in and slowly titrate it over. And you will find then that families are often much more on board with doing that. Time to refer on. So um, I certainly recommend that anyone with a non-IGE mediated allergy should have a dietitian involved. Um, that doesn't always happen, but I do think it's important because dietitians are, you know, the best people at looking at what's the nutritional intake of that baby and do they need anything else. If they have severe non-IGE mediated calcium protein allergies or an IGE mediated calcium protein allergy, then they'll need to be referred to secondary care to see an allergist or a pediatrician with a specialist interest in allergy. So just to go over this briefly again, so to confirm the diagnosis, you would ask them to exclude the food, so the cow's milk protein, for two to four weeks, and then reintroduce it in order to confirm that your diagnosis is correct. And once you've done that, um, if the symptoms have come back and you've confirmed that it's a non-IGE immediate allergy, then you would ask them to cut the food out for six months before it's retrialed. Usually infants with a non-IGE mediated to cow's milk protein allergy have milk excluded until about the age of 12 months, um, but it only needs to be for six months from the time it's taken out. And as I've said, this is done by a milk ladder, which is slightly different to the IGE mediated version, and there is one that IMAP has with some associated recipes. Now, progressing through the steps of this doesn't induce tolerance. It's simply finding which step can the child manage. So if we have a look at the example, uh, of the IMAP milk ladder, which you um, would be able to find associated with the recipes, you may find that a child's able to get to step four and then not um, tolerate any further. Now, if that happens, we ask them to remain at step four and retry it again in about three to six months. 
what happens is that you want to introduce the milk ladder at a time that the child is otherwise completely well and is not on any antibiotics. So essentially you don't want anything interfering or um, interfering with their health or that might cause symptoms. So you obviously with a non-IgE mediated allergy are looking at do they get gut symptoms, do they start vomiting, are they very unsettled? And if they are otherwise ill, then of course it'd be hard to work out um, is it the milk doing that uh, or is it the illness? So choose a time that they're well. You start on step one with a cookie or a biscuit and you introduce this into their diet and you slowly move through the steps, as I've said, and hopefully eventually you'll find a time that they'll be able to complete the milk ladder. And for most, that would be by about the age of two. So 60 to 75% of them will outgrow it by the age of two and almost 90% by the age of three. Um, some of them it takes much longer and some of them unfortunately will never fully outgrow it, but for the most, and I reassure my families that most of them will outgrow it often by school age. You need to re review your prescription for um, specialised formulas when the child is two um, or if the formula has been prescribed for over a year. It really is a very common scenario where families will um, say, oh, my child eats yoghurt and we pour cow's milk on their cereal uh, and can I have my prescription for my extensively hydrolyzed formula? Think, oh, no, that child's outgrown that allergy, they don't need to have it anymore and you just need to have that conversation with them. And also be looking at, you know, do they still need large quantities of formula? Have a look at their age, have a look at your guidelines and make sure you're prescribing appropriately to keep the cost down really. So I've mentioned the IMAP guidelines, which are the International Milk Allergy for Primary Care guidelines. They're really useful. I'm not going to fully go through them, but they'll be on the slide so you'll be able to review them afterwards. But you can see it talks about mild to moderate non-IGE mediated calcium protein allergy, severe non-IGE, and then the mild to moderate um, IgE and severe IgE. It talks about all the signs and symptoms that we've just gone through and how to diagnose each of those. And then it goes on and talks about if you're breastfed, breastfeeding, what would you do? Which we've talked about excluding the milk and prescribing calcium and vitamin D. And if you're formula fed, what to do and how to reintroduce the trial. So it's a really useful guideline that you have to refer when you think, oh, what did Helen say? Then you can look back at it. And then there's just a few um, extra tools that I want to mention that have been um, designed by Nestle Health Science. So Smilesback is a mobile app that's only available in the UK that families um, can download and use. Uh, in my experience, families who have a child with allergy often talk for a long time uh, and want to tell you everything about their child and everything about their bowels and how often they vomited. Um, and as we've said, we want them to feel heard and this app really helps them feel heard. They'll be able to chart all of these different bits and pieces about um, how many times did they vomit, what were their nappies like, what's their skins like. And then the great thing is it will download a report for you, which will help us then be able to look at it to work out whether or not um, we feel that allergy is likely. But it will certainly help families feel like they're heard. So that's something you can think about. And then for us as physicians, what we can think about is the COMIS tool, so the Cow's Milk Related Symptoms and Score Awareness Tool. So this is scored from 0 to 33, and a score of 12 or more was arbitrarily chosen uh, as a threshold to diagnose children at risk of cow's milk protein allergy. And some of the studies that have been done, it showed that has a predictive value of 75 to 80%. So it's something that is useful uh, to help us think about cow's milk protein allergy. And that's all we ever want to do, really. It's not a validated scoring system, uh, but you can see it talks about all the different bits and pieces that we've mentioned. So now, how long does a child cry for? How much do they vomit? What are their stools like? Uh, what's their skin like? And do they have any respiratory symptoms? And you can use the Smiles, um, the Smile Back app, uh, the information from that to add into the playlist to help you work it out. But also, you know, when you're not as au fait as perhaps I am with the non IGE media strategy, it might prompt you to remind you what questions to ask. So in summary, allergy is incredibly common. Um, and it really does have a significant impact on not only the patient, but also their families. And an allergy focused key is allergy focused history is absolutely key in diagnosing allergy. And if you're suspicious of IgE mediated allergy, then you can undertake testing, either an IgE mediated blood test or a skin prick test uh, or a food challenge to diagnose uh, your um, suspicions. But for non IgE mediated allergy, you need to exclude the food for two to four weeks and then reintroduce it to confirm your diagnosis. 
because if you don't do this, then you haven't confirmed the diagnosis. So it's absolutely crucial for these patients that we do this to make sure we are giving them the right information. Thank you very much. And I'll now take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Helen Howes, for your brilliant presentation. And good morning to everyone who's joined us for today's um, webinar. I'm Charlotte Doncaster, Scientific and Medical Affairs Dietitian for Nestle Health Science. And I will be reading out your questions to Dr. Helen Howes to, for, for her to answer. If anything we do not get a chance to cover today, we will include on our educational hub. So um, first question, we've had quite a lot of questions about whether we can access the slides and is it possible to download them? So yes, we will be sending the slides out. Um, what we'll do is we'll be sending them up by the follow-up email. Um, there will also be on, included on that a link to our educational hub uh, where you can access and watch the whole presentation again. And any of the questions that we don't get a chance to answer today, we will make sure that, we, that they're included on there. Uh, and the website address is www.nplushub.co.uk. But like I said, there will be a link um, and the slides will be attached in the follow-up email. So the first question for Helen, uh, Dr. Helen Howes, is, is there a formula to calculate the amount of formula milk per week or per day to prescribe? And also, is there an age limit to prescribe? Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Obviously, when I just want to just say that obviously I work in the UK, so most of the answers are coming from my UK perspective. So occasionally things may be a bit different if you're um, listening in from other countries. Um, traditionally, when you're talking about um, infants who are under six months of age, we have a look at the calculation of using 150 mils per kilogram a day when you're working out how much formula should they be using. So perhaps if you had an infant that um, keeps vomiting, you may work out are they being overfed, for instance, by using that calculation. Um, what you'd find is that most of your feeding guidelines that you may have locally, um, for instance, in my area of Wessex, we have Wessex feeding guidelines that you can Google if you wanted to, if you're out of area, not sure. Um, they would give you an indication of how many um, how many tins of formula to prescribe depending on their age. So usually if they're less than six months of age, it's going to be somewhere between seven to 12 tins. And in terms of a maximum age, um, I mean, we do have some horror stories of adults um, still being pre prescribed near Kate without, uh, for instance, without good reason and other amino acid formulas without good reason. Um, but generally, we're talking about infants here with cow's milk protein allergy. So once you're kind of getting to the two year of age mark, you'd be, you'd be questioning why they would still continue to need a formula. So that's sort of what I'd be thinking, because there are often then other dietary milks that could be used as an alternative. And unless secondary care have concerns about um, continued issues with their growth, for instance, then most formulas are only continuous until about the age of two. Thank you. Um, we've got another question here that it says um, that you said during the talk um, that cow's milk allergy only occurs in children between three to six months of age. But according to the guidelines from the WHO, um, children should be exclusively breastfed for up to six months. Uh, and do you think that breastfeeding may be a kind of concrete solution for this problem? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think something that we all um, struggle with is as, as a dilemma, really, of how can we promote and continue um, to get um, infants to breastfeed, breastfeed so their mums to continue breastfeeding and obviously the World Health Organization do recommend that infants, uh, infants are exclusively breastfed till six months of age and that's something that I did with all three of mine so personally speaking I always discuss in clinic about the importance of breastfeeding, share breastfeeding tips where I can um, and as we've seen in the presentation you can see that if they are breastfed then their risk of cow's milk allergy is, is much lower only 0.5% but we do have to be realistic and understand that some mums will have chosen not to breastfeed um, and or that they've struggled and they really can't or there may be a variety of reasons like for instance mums might be on prescribed medications and in which case it really isn't our job as healthcare professionals to make them feel guilty about that. They need to understand the evidence around breastfeeding and that it's better for them but if they can't and they choose not to then of course there needs to be an alternative otherwise these babies wouldn't survive and that's when we would be using these 
formulas. I would never recommend if their mums are breastfeeding and baby does have a cow's milk protein allergy that the breastfeeding is stopped or try and promote that wherever possible. Um, so really this is just an alternative for those babies who aren't breastfed. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. And um, another question is how to distinguish between functional gastro intolerance disorders and non IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy clinically uh, and, yeah. and by kind of other investigative me 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 sorry, methods. <laughs> Method. Okay, so this yeah. this is where that um, that history taking really comes into its into its own. As I said, if you get into the habit of when you have a crying infant running through the various questions, so what's their skin like? Have they got any skin involvement? Are they congested? Have they got any upper gut symptoms of say reflux, crying, vomiting, and lower gut symptoms of um, explosive diarrhea, soft stool constipation, blood in the stool, or failure to thrive? So the functional um, gastrointestinal disorders tend to only be one thing, so maybe constipation or um, a, a, a crying baby in the evening. So the history in itself should help you. But where there's doubt, this is why I think it is so, so important with a non-IgE allergy because there is no diagno there's no test that exists as, as such at the moment. The test is take the milk out for two to four weeks, see if things get better, and then when they do, put the milk back in for a re-challenge. If the symptoms don't return, the likelihood is this was a functional gastrointestinal disorder that's resolved. If the symptoms do return, then you have your diagnosis of a non-IgE mediated cow's milk protein allergy. So my key Thanks. message and that I shout about all the time is please re-challenge. If you don't re-challenge, you haven't proven the diagnosis. Thank you. And also, um, Helen, when it's, they were just talking about as well, uh, who would manage that? So who would manage the functional gastrointolerance disorders in the, in the intestinal sorry, oh, yeah. disorders. So functional gastrointestinal disorders are a group of disorders that have no biochemical or structural abnormality. So essentially they're normal for the majority of babies, over half of babies would have them. So really it's primary care, it's reassurance, 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 reassurance to mums and dads and there are some strategies that you can employ um, and uh, the Rome criteria talks more about those um, and you can email me if you need to and I can help with them but it is really primary care who'd be managing these things. And if, what would you recommend for a strict vegetarian family? Um, so again, in the in the UK, you'd find that all not that I would recommend amino acid formulas first line, but if they were on an amino acid formula, these would be suitable for um, vegetarian families. And there is one brand of EHF that doesn't contain the porcine enzyme, which is the concern with extensively hydrolyzed formulas. So there is a brand that can be used. Um, and I think we've got time probably for one more question. So parents often report of wheezing, particularly to the dietitians, and then um, and then they get referred as IG mediated cow's milk allergy. But then after taking a following a clinical history and kind of putting the other pieces of the jigsaw puzzles together, it tends to appear to be non IG mediated cow's milk allergy. Uh, and the skin prick test to the IG would come back as negative. Uh, do you have any experience or comments about that? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. It's not, it's not something I particularly see very commonly, I have to say. I think part of the issue of this is coming from the fact that if you look about evidence about how, how well will do parents in particular report wheeze, um, it is actually very low. So people's subjective um, kind of experience of what wheeze is is often not what we actually believe wheeze is as healthcare professionals. So I think that's the first instance. I think I suspect what is happening here is that we know that congestion is associated with a non-IgE mediated allergy and I suspect that the, the babies are quite congested and that therefore they're snuffly and when they're feeding parents may hear those kind of crackly noises of the snottiness and think that that's wheeze because that's often quite um, often what wheeze is reported as. So if you take that clear history of you know what are the gut symptoms um, as we've talked about all those non-IgE symptoms in fact, if they had wheeze from IgE mediated allergy, then we're talking about a baby who's having anaphylaxis. For a, for a start, they're probably not going to look settled. And it can happen, but it is uncommon to be having anaphylaxis with no other symptoms, so no skin involvement. So you would expect to see hives, or urticaria, possibly angioedema. So it's really being clear about those differentiating symptoms. 
But at the end of the day, if you really don't know, then the correct um, response would be to check a skin protest or a blood test IgE and just confirm and just be just keep the baby safe, really. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Helen House. And again, thank you very much for your presentation today. Those are going to be all the questions we have time for today. And um, like I said, the slides will be sent out um, via the follow-up email, and there will be a link to our educational hub where you can access and watch the whole presentation again. Um, and you will also be able to kind of see any of the questions that we have been unable to answer today. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.